Hello, and welcome to the Empowering Agric Agriculture Through Tribal Sovereignty Academy. This resource will cover tips and considerations for navigating food supply chains, um, targeted for new and beginning farmers and ranchers, youth working in agriculture, and agriculture enterprises. So as we walk through this module, uh, we'll be providing a little bit of information about the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative, um, providing some framework and discussion points around identifying outputs in your production scheme and your market requirements um, that the um, markets and distribution channels and customers around you um, may ask you to fulfill and supplying to them, and navigating um, potential distribution channels how you model resiliency in food supply chains, especially when we're looking at kind of contemporary supply chain issues and dynamics, and then tips for accessing new markets. So the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative was established in the University of Arkansas School of Law in 2013 by Dean Emeritus Stacy Leeds, who is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, and founding director Janie sims Hip, who is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. Our mission is to enhance health and wellness in tribal communities by advancing healthy food systems, diversified economic development, and cultural food traditions in Indian country. And we accomplish this work through a variety of channels, um, working with tribal governments um, by providing a free, at no cost, model, model tribal food and agriculture code um, serving as a comprehensive set of food and agriculture laws for review, adoption, and implementation by tribes, um, supporting the Native Farm Bill Coalition as the research partner, and working with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to provide um, education, training, and outreach to tribal nations and communities, food growers, processors, and manufacturers on the Food Safety Modernization Act um, through our work in the Tribal Food Safety Alliance. I'm supporting Native youth and the next generation of um, youth leaders in agriculture through our Native Youth and Food and Agriculture Leadership Summit, um, facilitating agricultural production through tribal food sovereignty, through our overarching work, um, cultivating tribal food sovereignty across Indian country, um, supporting and promoting um, the work of um, agricultural enterprises and considerations that they might apply in navigating their food systems to help them scale up through uh, production tools and economic forecast models. For being or serving as a resource um, of policy research and analysis for industrial hemp production related to um, the farm bill. Uh, and then developing educational resources and research for child nutrition and food access programs in Indian country to support and st help strengthen food security and food access. So as you are building out um, your agricultural enterprise or as you are getting started in your agricultural enterprise, identifying the scope and scale of your production is an important first step because it allows you to get a sense of what you actually intend to put out to the market and how you tend to in, intend to use the um, assets and resources available to you um, to support that production environment. And so as you're looking at um, the economies of production, generally speaking, there are two different types of economies or ways of, kind of moving uh, goods and services out to the market. Um, that you might want to think about. The first is looking at scale. And as we talk about scale, we'll really be talking about the level of production for one good and the level of market access related to that product. As we talk about scope, um, we'd be looking at the level of diversification in your operation environment, like the number of distinct goods or services by type um, that you're actually producing or serving. So for each area of your production, and these areas can be defined as large and as small as you need based on you know, the, the operating scope, based on the different markets that you're looking at, and also based on the strategies that you'd like to incorporate um, for your land and other assets. So 
As we think about these things, it might be helpful to consider the following questions. So what products or products um, do you intend to produce? Um, and how do you intend to do that like through cover cropping? And then what is the amount of harvest that you expect to grow? So as you look at building out your market and uh, working with different vendors and suppliers, um, we might be tempted to think about the supply chain as kind of the entirety of the space, right? How do you move your products who are working on a farm um, from your um, from the land to where it meets the customer? But there might be many more steps in between um, where you are um, and kind of who is actually more directly serving the customer. Uh, likewise, there may be some additional suppliers above the supply chain, above you in the supply chain um, that are uh, helping you to provide inputs, whether they be through um, donation or through um, your purchase of them at the market. And so as we look at these um, factors, we can consider kind of how these goods flow through um, market channels or market chains um, through distribution channels. And, and consider distribution channels as the systems and processes through which goods and services are moved across the supply chain. That includes how um, those goods and processes are transformed into other products, like bringing seed to actual to um, being a fruit or vegetable for harvest. As we look at nodes in the supply chain, and we're, we'd really be talking about um, organizations or individuals that produce or move goods or services across the supply chain. And so the distribution channel marks the actual flow um, from one end to the other. The node marks the individuals or enterprises that are working in the space and the links mark connection points between these nodes. Um, they can also reflect the relationships that you have um, with your suppliers or with your customers. And so as you're looking at your space in the supply chain, rather than trying to map out the whole, which can be a daunting task, it may be easier to look at first tier vendors or first tier customers. And so from this standpoint, we'd be looking at all nodes, one link up in your chain and all nodes, one link down. And for agricultural production as well, um, we can also look at um, the land itself as a first tier supplier, because you are working with the land specifically, carrying that relationship through you know, to ensure that you have a viable product for either um, sale, if that is your intended purpose, or for um, distribution um, throughout the community. So if as we kind of build out um, the, this idea of a supply chain, um, part of what we continue to see um, is an in, uh, interest in working with Indian country is building out kind of a closed loop supply chain in Indian country. And that largely means that uh, all of the nodes of production and distribution are largely owned by tribal um, enterprises or American Indians and Alaska Natives and they operate within tribal land spaces. As we look at creating that closed loop or managing that closed loop, it may still be a helpful consideration depending on your level of scale and scope to consider serving outside customers and exporting those goods off of the tribal nation to non-native spaces to help increase the monetary circulation by bringing in new flows of revenue onto your operation that can be uh, moved around um, the tribal land that you're in tribal nation that you are on. And so as you look at either building out relationships with the um, first tier vendors that you're working with, um, as you're working with different commercial markets, especially, um, you may come across requests for proposals. And those requests for proposals or RFPs will likely in, 
indicate um, the required production scale and required food specifications that are required by um, the um, different kind of markets that you are um, engaging. Um, the, these may also be kind of reference points that you yourself are keeping in mind as you are kind of making a request of your suppliers. Um, how much seed do you need? How much input do you need? What kind of tools and equipment that you need? Um, what is the purpose of those tools and equipment? And as you move those goods um, from production to harvest, the markets that you intend to sell to may also have requests for proposals and um, similar um, statements of request, um, making those statements of and of required production scale and food specifications. And so as you think about how you meet those requirements from the market that you intend to sell to, and start to ask yourself, how does the potential revenue generated from that market weigh against the production inputs, all of those things that you need to put into your system to make sure that you have a viable product that meets those standards. So there are a couple of different ways that we can look at this from an economic standpoint. The first is to look at um, the cost of goods sold, which is the cost related to producing all of the products of a distinct marketable type or marketable products like labor, um, inputs, overhead, anything as part of your enterprise where you are expensing to make sure that you have enough inputs to move that good to sale. And so if we look at how cost of goods sold would relate to the level of sales or revenue that you would need to generate to make sure that your other costs are met um, that relate to kind of having a household um, that might relate to other areas of your operation um, that might relate to making sure that um, of the remaining areas of your operation can remain viable based on kind of the, the level of inputs and sales for the singular product. Um, and start to kind of build this under the economic reference point or enterprise reference point of a gross margin. And so um, gross margin is a mathematical formula where you identify sales, subtract the cost of goods sold from those sales, and then divide that um, difference by the sales itself. And that will provide you a percentage that indicates the amount of revenue remaining to cover those other costs that are referenced, um, including fees, capital investments, and paying the owners yourself. So gross margin is not the same as profit margin. Uh, profit margin is a little bit more encompassing of all of the um, different spaces that you are working with, the total costs that you are working with, not just to provide for the inputs necessary to reach those production levels, but every expense necessary to keep your operation going. And so as we look at profit margin, we can consider it the profitability of all products marketed or the profitability of all products marketed of a specific type. And so to look at profit margin, you'd be looking at sales um, minus the total expenses of everything that you have to um, put in um, to keep your operation going and then divide that difference by sales. Um, as I mentioned, gross margin is not the same as profit margin because you can have a um, low profit margin but a high gross margin. Um, that might mean that your farm is highly leveraged, which means in, in non, in, in, so we kind of think about what being leveraged means from a business context, means that you carry more debt liability, you owe more than you have um, put in a monetary stake as, your own, as being the owner. And so if you are a highly leveraged enterprise, you may look at, um, different areas that help to offset that that debt to make sure that you're able to pay it down so that you can recoup 
um, that revenue to keep it um, to support um, internal generations, including um, renovations, kind of building out your asset base, et cetera. So now that we've kind of had this foundational understanding of what you need as part of your agricultural enterprise um, to receive in revenue to keep your operation going, we can start to look at different potential distribution channels, different links that you might want to build out or might be interested in building out um, to support the viability of your agricultural operation. And so each um, distribution channel that you might work with uh, may have a different level of um, food specifications that are generally required. They may also require you to increase or have a greater um, volume of supply that's available more frequently. And so when you're looking at a food stand and operating a food stand, that is a space where you control all of the logistics behind when it happens, what types of food you're selling at that food stand. It can be something that you do on the side of the road um, kind of once a week, or it could be done more, even more infrequently than that. For you pick operations, um, you traditionally have uh, a relatively large amount of space depending on the community or the market that you're serving, but you are building up the, um, all of your production in one area um, to that you pick operation. And so um, the goal here would be to bring a group of food to harvest, bundle of food to harvest, and allow community members um, potentially at cost to come in by, um, at cost by weight to pick what uh, fruits or vegetables they would like to take home with them. Um, for community-supported agriculture um, or CSA boxes, um, you might be working with community members um, to make sure that they have kind of a weekly box of food that's available um, through specific harvest periods. So CSAs don't even necessarily have to be year round but you'd be able to control specifically what the relationships are that you're working with, how many people you're providing food for, and what is included in those boxes. And so that is largely based on the relationship that you'd have with the consumer, but you are generally controlling um, the um, internal, excuse me, you're generally managing those logistics internally. Once you start looking at farmers markets and beyond, um, then you start looking at more selling um, through commercial markets as standards <clears throat> and the market channel that you are looking at may have um, different levels of, like I said, different levels of food specification that are required. Um, so it may require you to be gap uh, compliant, um, fulfilling good agricultural practices and meeting those third party audits. Um, some may just require you to meet uh, the standards of the produce safety rule under the Food Safety Modernization Act. And so it's important to understand in working with that farmer's market manager or owner and of what would be expected of you. And as you look at working and selling to wholesale distributors or restaurants or grocery and C stores or public institutions, um, make sure that you keep a, um, a take a good look at that request for proposals um, or kind of the vendor requirements to make sure that your operation would be able to meet those standards in, in terms of um, scale and um, the strategies that you're using. <clears throat> so if we look at kind of building out to those commercial markets, and one of the main obstacles that frequently comes up and working in agricultural and, and food systems is accessing a distribute and accessing that distribution channel is meeting the scale of production, meeting the level of food that is required um, to make sure that you have um, a constant amount of sale to that um, to that vendor, or even if it's just like a one-off, uh, meeting that that um, production threshold. Is in farms like any other enterprise are restricted by the amount of asset that they have. Um, you can't necessarily grow more than your land allows. <clears throat> and so um, 
if you start trying to grow more than your assets otherwise allow, you start to strain those assets and the yield or return that you have um, from those assets or from the inputs that you're working with may actually decrease. And from there, you are generally moving from an, a practice of building out economies of scale to building out diseconomies of scale where you're working against those internal limitations of your operation. And so the goal here is really to increase the quantity of product that you have available for market. And you can do, those through, do this through a number of ways. The first to consider is kind of if you are especially um, starting out as a new um, agricultural enterprise, there is no, um, there is no shame in kind of just starting small and growing and building out your operation and, and making sure that you have the foundation necessary to uh, improve your um, and, and increase um, the amount of space or the amount of tools that you have or the amount of, and of other controls that you might use to increase your yield outputs. And so you'd be progressively increasing your cash flow, the amount of revenue that you're bringing in to purchase or improve your asset base. It may also be a consideration um, as you are starting small or as you are growing, or if you are a larger enterprise that is still trying to tap into an even larger market space, to partner with a food aggregator like a food hub or a cooperative that would be working with you to consolidate agricultural products to meet those market needs. And then finally, as you look at um, kind of building out your economies of scale. Um, as I mentioned, as we were talking about what a production scale looks like, um, you might consider if you have surplus goods that aren't necessary for one market, diversifying into other markets and distribution networks so that you'd be able to um, kind of help to broaden um, the reach of whatever agricultural product you are producing, um, make sure that it helps to, um, excuse me, it helps to increase your cash flows. But beyond that, um, when we're looking at um, kind of managing your space in the supply chain, it also supports more resiliency. Because if there is something that happens that if your primary market channel is a, um, a farmer's market, for example, um, if there is something that happens like um, COVID-19, where you have to alter or modify how you work with that farmer's market, um, you might still have kind of more direct consumer relationships and customer relationships by providing um, community supported agriculture boxes or CSA boxes um, to those consumers. And so you'd still have that relationship and you'd still be able to bring food um, to a market, you'd still be able to kind of incur um, and, and kind of gain revenue um, to keep your operation going through that stopgap. And building resiliency in your food supply chain um, is so important, it cannot be understated. Um, as we look at um, contemporary supply chains, um, and especially this is something that we've seen in the global pandemic and in, in COVID-19, um, contemporary supply chains, um, including outside of agriculture and food system spaces, were largely focused on building out a system of efficiencies. So you'd have um, maybe one vendor or one or two vendors that are providing inputs and you need all of that input to make sure that you can provide and, and build out a product that moves into that next customer base or that next distribution channel, that next link. And so with COVID, we saw um, in, in many cases across Indian country, stop gaps in supply chains where there were delays or breakages in what um, an enterprise was able to build out um, from that um, kind of a, a higher point in the supply chain as it kind of works its way through to a consumer. And as those breakages or delays occurred, it created this ripple effect where the next person had a delay and the next node had a delay and the next node had a delay until at some point, 
um, uh, grocery stores and convenience stores had a higher out of stock rate where there just weren't goods on their shelves um, that were available. And so as we look at kind of building into this space and as we look at um, kind of making sure that your operation is resilient and viable, we can consider these things as lessons learned. And so we can kind of reflect on the importance of managing those relationships and reinforcing resilience as a part of your practice. And so in working in the supply chain, um, some considerations to keep in mind are if you are working with um, suppliers that are farther out, um, you may look at um, partnering as well with suppliers if they're available that are a little bit closer. And so you'd be able to keep both of those channels available to you in case there is a stopgap that would delay you from getting access to viable and vital inputs. And so as we look at kind of this principle of nearshoring, um, it allows you to um, kind of build resiliency by making sure that you are working with multiple um, vendors, um, but it also helps to decrease the lead time that's associated for filling your orders. Um, and here, as we're talking about lead time, it's the time between you placing the order and the order actually being fulfilled where you receive the inventory that was requested. So other considerations to look at include kind of diversifying and building redundancy. Um, it doesn't even necessarily have to be through near shoring. Um, but purchasing suppliers and operation inputs, excuse me, purchasing supplies and operation inputs from multiple suppliers to help fill those stop gaps. Um, building communication um, with your suppliers and vendors and also with your customers so that if there is a delay, if there is an issue that is foreseeable, um, that we can foster awareness of those things before they actually rear their ugly head so that you can pivot um, to other areas to make sure that you are able to continue your operation in a good way. Um, something else to consider is to um, prioritize your suppliers um, by determining which suppliers provide strategic value, which suppliers provide inputs that are absolutely necessary to keep things going, or which suppliers are more transactional and ad hoc. So you can um, help to kind of create this, this framework of, of levels for the um, enterprises that you're working with um, to make sure that you are able to sustain um, having access to those inputs. That doesn't prioritize the people behind those roles because um, each of those individuals is still important, but it helps to prioritize those dynamics that you are working with so that you can um, kind of weigh the significance of um, different alternative strategies. And then diversifying market access. Um, as we've mentioned, that can be such an important way uh, of making sure that you are able to get a consistent source of revenue um, by sourcing products and goods to multiple markets. So as you look at building out into new markets, there are a couple of considerations to keep in mind here. So the first is that um, the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service um, through the federal government procures food from certified food vendors um, for a variety of different programs, including like the food distribution program on Indian reservations or the commods program um, for food banks and um, many other spaces. So if you are interested in selling food to the Agricultural Marketing Service, we've included the link here for reference, as well as a webinar that we conducted on May 30th, 2019, on how to become a USDA Agricultural Marketing Service certified vendor. Another resource that's available to help you in accessing new markets is the Intertribal Agriculture Council. And they provide um, two main platforms to support that market access, including the American Indian Foods Export Program. And through that program, they provide members with a platform to showcase their products and culture um, with the world through international trade show activities and buyer missions. And separately through their Native Food Connections Program, where they help to create domestic market opportunities for Native American and Alaska Native 
um, agribusinesses while providing marketing education and collaboration with Native conferences. So thank you for joining us in this module and discussion of, kind of navigating the food supply chain and the Empowering Agriculture Through Tribal Sovereignty Academy.